expertise this morning.
So we are here to declare today as a unified church that we do believe in you. And all we want to do is follow you, Lord Jesus. You are Lord of our lives. We are here to worship you today. We are here to hear from you today, Jesus. We just pray that you will open our hearts to hear what you're speaking to us individually and as a church. And just move us to do your will, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day today. We thank you that we can worship you. We have air in our lungs to sing your praises. We have another day to share your love. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. read for you. Of course, I don't need my glasses. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat the bread and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under the judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged, we are being disciplined by the Lord. I used to think I understood this. I mean, I, I thought I understood is that we come to the Lord's table and we remember what Christ did for us on that cross. Remember everything about Christ, his, his life, his teachings, everything he did for us. And then we're supposed to look at ourselves and look at our sin and confess those sins to God and ask for forgiveness. And then we're good, right? That's what I thought. But there's something missing in that. You see, um, Paul says that um, with the unworthy manner is not discerning the body of Christ. And, and reconciling that with the self-examination is where I was missing out. You see, when we, when we confess our sins to God, we should remember that that sin is what put Christ on that cross. It's our fault. And that should cause us remorse. And we should repent. And with, now, I want to give you a real life example of this. I smoked cigarettes for 40 years. I began smoking before I was a believer. And I would come to the Lord's table and I would confess that. And I, would, I, I was truly sorry for it. And I would ask God for the forgiveness and the strength to quit. And I'd give them up, you know, for a week, a month at a time. But nevertheless, I'd pick them right back up. On July 21st of last year, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, pain across my chest, burning down my arms. And I was at my home in Arm City, just three blocks from the, from the fire department. 
They were there in five minutes. Within 20, I was at the hospital. Within 30 minutes of getting to the hospital, actually it was much less, but that was what we were told um, that it would be. Um, I was on the cath lab table, and, and the uh, cardiologist was going in my groin to go up into my heart and, and see what was going on. And I was conscious this whole time. I never lost consciousness uh, at this point. And I felt, I was conscious and I, I could feel it. My heart stopped. And I could feel it just twitching in my chest. And I said, something's going on in my heart. And the guy that was monitoring me, he said, yeah, doctor, do you see that D-pad, d -pad, get the paddles. I was conscious and I heard this. And then I said, I'm about to pass out. And I did. And I was had fallen asleep. I had laid on that table and I was dead. They shocked me, brought me back, you know, brought me back. CPR, I woke up, felt like a truck ran over my chest, you know, but, but it was only by the grace and mercy of God that I needed to be. I was being disciplined. I was coming under judgment. But through the mercy of God, I was in the right place. Now think about this. That was July 21st. July 4th, I was down in the Keys. And I was spending the night on a boat out on the water. Had this happened on July 4th, I wouldn't be here today. So if you find yourself over and over, I would encourage you to change. Because you will come under judgment. You will be disciplined. And one I'm working on right now, I'm going to confess this. Maybe you're guilty of it too, but road rage. <laughs> I have confessed that. God for help with it and you know something about somebody in that left lane on a four lane highway but I do not want to find out what the discipline is going to be if I, if I don't change that so I'm going to will you pray with me Father thank you so much for your mercy and grace thank you for your son Jesus who came and he took our sins he, he took them upon himself and took the punishment on the cross. Lord, forgive us when we fail. Bless this cup and bless this loaf. Through your son, amen. If you'll prepare this if you haven't already. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he said, take eat, this is my body. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, new covenant in my blood. Whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Wow, that was hard. <laughs> Next one's easy. <laughs> We're at offering time. Yeah. Yay, right? Remember we used to do that all the time? That's the way it should be. You know, first, before I go any further, I want to say I am not an elder of this church. I'm not a deacon. I do, you know, I, I'm not on, this, on the um, payroll here. I don't, uh, I'm not on the staff. I say that because I want you to understand my motives. My motives and what I'm about to say is, you know, when you discover something amazing, you just want to share it. Well, that, that's my motive. That's, that's my only motive. And, you know, as I travel... And I, I visit churches, I, I find that um, they basically eliminated the offering meditation. They have prayer, you know, but, but there's no meditation. And we don't hear a lot about it in the pulpit. And, and I really have a hard time understanding that because money is mentioned more than heaven and hell put together. If you add them both up and put it all together, money still mentioned more. More than half of Jesus' parents.
parables were about money. You know, so money and what we do with our money is important. In fact, there's a quote, and and I I thought it was Jake applies to the author uh, of this quote, but it's they're not my words or something. Money is one of the most powerful spiritual aspects of life. It will either draw you closer to God or it will drive you away. Now, looking out, give you a little background. This is more of a testimonial than, than a meditation. But I grew up a preacher's kid. I was born on a Thursday and I was in church and Sunday school that next Sunday. In fact, every time the church doors were open, I was there. And I was a preacher's kid, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I think maybe the devil works harder in preacher's kids. <laughs> but I had a reputation to live up to, and I think I did a fine job, and I think there's one man sitting right there that can attest to that. <laughs> but, you know, I, you can't grow up in the home I did. You know, I, I was of the mindset that, yeah, there, there was a higher power, um, but I didn't, I, I still went to church because if I didn't go to church, my father wouldn't talk to me, and I wanted a relationship with my father, so I still went to church, but, you know, I didn't really believe, and um, I was 30 years old, and uh, um, I had just started a business two Two years previous that was failing I mean I, mean, I was basically um, emotionally socially financially and spiritually bankrupt and I you know I don't know why I, I did this but my, my father always made sure I had a Bible and I kept it on my coffee table just because when he would come by he would see it you know I didn't pick it up very often but on this evening I, I first considered harming myself but, you know, I wasn't. I was pretty depressed. Now, for whatever reason, I just picked up the Bible and opened it. Bible roulette. You know, just opened it up. And I turned to Malachi 3. And it's about robbing God. And the verse that got me was verse 10. And it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out now I've come to I understood that right then God revealed that to me what that means um, I didn't believe it in fact I, I literally laughed like you're going to have more with less that, you know, that doesn't make sense but the part that got me was testing me in and I was 30 years old, I'm 59 now. And I can tell you, I've tested God. I've tested him in many ways. It, it was obvious, it, you know, it worked. And that's really what I, I'm ashamed to admit of, that God won my heart through my wallet. And that's a shameful thing, but it's the truth. But I, I even, at one point in my life, decided I was going to give based on what I wanted to make, not on what I was actually making. And what I found out is you can't outgive God because he's faithful. But then something happened. I began to think, wow, I thought I had something to do with it, you know. And I thought, wow, look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. When pride comes into your life, bad things happen. Bad things did. In times of plenty, a tithe is easy. But when money gets tight, it's not so easy. And I, I failed. I mean, it wasn't an intentional test to see if God would quit blessing me, but he did. You know, and, and it was for a couple of years I, I was slacking. And I suffered all of those two years. And, and, and what turned me around what made me and it, these words came from an elder because I, I had you know told him I've been struggling financially and told him that I have been struggling with my tithe and he said well God understands you can't afford to tithe that's not right 
But it, it was what I needed to hear at the time because when he said that, I knew that wasn't right. What God understood was that I did not trust him enough to tithe because that was the reality. And really, you know, I, I hear these elders say how much they appreciate the giving. And I, I'm sure they do. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You fire me. It's all right. But this church doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. I mean, as long as God wants this church to continue, it will. With or without you. But the, the whole thing about this is it, it's about your faith. And you see what he does and how, how he responds to that. I mean, it, you know, it, it really just, I mean, I mean, this is the only place in the Bible where God says test me. It's the only test you got. So if you doubt God, there's your test. I'm going to stop now if Mark won't have any comments. So <laughs> pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. You are so, so, so generous in all that you do. Lord, we ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings, that you would multiply them, and you would put them to work here on this earth for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Steve. And uh, if we run out of time, you know, just like a football game, the best part of a football game is overtime, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, oh, please don't be serious about that. Um, uh, I would encourage you to open up to John chapter 14 because we have spent the last two weeks talking about God, God the Father, Jesus Christ. But today we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to get have done renovations on their hose on their homes could you please raise your hand if you've done some renovations on your homes okay whether it was you or somebody else okay we've all done some home renovation uh, mary and i would like to do some home renovation uh, the problem is i am not handy and um so i think it would be great like if, if you wanted to do some home renovations wouldn't it be nice if chip and joanna Gaines came along and did the renovations on your house i mean they're really good i mean you watch them on tv and they've got quite talent for that uh, or maybe you wanted to take some singing lessons, and uh, you sign up for singing lessons, you find out that your singing coach, your vocal coach, is Adele. She's quite a powerful singer. Maybe you take some cooking lessons from Gordon Ramsay. Maybe you go down to the YMCA and um, hire a personal trainer, and you find out that it's Dwayne Johnson. He'd be a pretty good personal trainer, I imagine. Uh, what if your kids sign up for baseball and you find out that their coach is Aaron Judge or maybe some other professional baseball player? Well, if we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, I figured that we should go to the best. We should go to the best teacher who could teach us about the Holy Spirit, and that would be Jesus. Jesus 15, 15, and 16. We're not going to cover all of that today. In fact, I'm going to mention some other places where you can learn about the Holy Spirit in the Bible. But we're going to start in John chapter 14 because let's hear what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. I would, I would say that he's the best expert on the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go into John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. And these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now, it's interesting because Jesus says in that verse, verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And that's just a friendly reminder because everything in the word of God revolves around love, correct? Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second command is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus always brings us back to love. Love the Lord, love God, and love one another. And in the mind of Jesus, love is demonstrated by obedience. That's what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commands. Then Jesus says, I'm going to give you another advocate, another advocate. So that would make us wonder, well, who is the first advocate that God sent? The first advocate that God sent is Jesus himself. Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry when we read these verses in John 14. 
We know what happens, right? We know that he's going to be crucified. He will be buried. He'll be raised from the dead. And then what will happen about 40 days after the resurrection? He will ascend back into heaven. And someday he'll come back. Someday he'll return. So as Jesus leaves the earth to go back to heaven, God's people will need another advocate to be with them. And Jesus says the other advocate is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. He is the other advocate. Jesus was first. The Holy Spirit will come second. And uh, if you really pay close attention in verse 16 and 17, we see all, all three persons of the Trinity. Jesus talks about the Father. He talks about himself. And he talks about the spirit of truth. And I think part of the problem with understanding the Holy Spirit is... We can understand a father and a son, right? That's the relationship between God and Jesus, a father and son. We can understand that. The Holy Spirit of the Lord. But we should not think that the Holy Spirit is inferior because he comes after Jesus. That's not the way it is. He's not inferior because he comes after Jesus. Please don't think of the Holy Spirit as the third wheel in the Trinity. Did you ever have a third wheel hanging out with you? You know, maybe when you were dating or something like that? The Holy Spirit is not just a third wheel in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is being sent. The Holy Spirit was sent by God and sent by Jesus to help us. And that's what we want to talk about today. Now, Jesus answers a lot of questions for us right off the bat. When Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is an advocate. So when we ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Jesus wants us to know that the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He's also called the comforter and the counselor. And you might think, why are there so many words, so many different translations to try to explain who the Holy Spirit is? Well, that's part of the problem, is that the English language, we don't have one good word to summarize all that the Holy Spirit can do. So some translations use the word advocate, some use the words comforter, some use the words counselor, sometimes they use the word helper. But that's what we need to remember. The bottom line is that the Holy Spirit has come to help us. The Holy Spirit has come to help Christian people, including you and me. But we have all these different words to try to explain who the Holy Spirit is. In the Greek language, the uh, Greek word for, uh, for advocate is paraclete. Paraclete would be someone who is called alongside. And all of these words that we use, comforter, advocate, counselor, they all involve times in life when someone comes alongside of you, provide support. You need a counselor to come alongside of you to guide you and help you through difficult times. An advocate comes alongside of you when you need somebody to defend you. And that's what Jesus is saying about the Holy Spirit. Whether you want to call him the advocate or the comforter or the counselor or the helper, no matter what you, what, no matter how you think of him, no matter what you call him, he's right beside you. He's, he's alongside of you. We use this phrase uh, in today's world, you know, I got your back, or we got your back. Jesus, is, Jesus wants you to know the Holy Spirit has got your back. He's there for you. He's called alongside of you. What is the Holy Spirit doing? Jesus says the Holy Spirit has come to help us. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. We also notice that Jesus answers the question, where is the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus said, just remember that. When Jesus was on the earth, when Jesus was in this world, if he was in the Jordan River or if he was in Bethlehem or Jerusalem, he could only be in one place at a time, correct? The Holy Spirit can go everywhere with all Christians all around the world. He's not limited by time and space. How long was Jesus on the earth? He was here for about... 33 years. The Holy Spirit has been working on the earth for the past 2,000 years. So better understand the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he's going to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. And uh, sometimes the, the tricky question that we're trying to answer is when did the Holy Spirit arrive? When did the Holy Spirit arrive? Now sometimes we break the Bible down into a few parts, three parts. We look at the Old Testament and then the Gospels, which is the life of Jesus, and then the rest of the New Testament. We kind of break it down like that sometimes. We have the Old Testament, the Gospel story of Jesus, and then the New Testament. 
And to simplify things, we usually say that God the Father, God was at work in the Old Testament. Jesus was obviously at work in the Gospels. And the Holy Spirit is at work in the rest of the New Testament and in the church. And that's true, but that's kind of painting with a broad brush. Because God is always at work throughout the Bible. Jesus is at work throughout the Bible. And the Holy Spirit is at work throughout the Bible. But Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would not be sent to his people until after he left. Here's what Jesus said. Again, we're going to the expert. Jesus in John 16, 7, Jesus said, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the, adv the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, just as a reminder, the advocate is who? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The advocate is the Holy Spirit. Now, could you imagine being one of the apostles and Jesus says, It's good that I'm leaving you? They would have said, no way. You know, I bet Peter would have said something, right? You know, Peter would have answered back, Lord, how is it good that you leave us? But Jesus said, it's good for you that I'm going away, because if I, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus says there was a proper time for the Holy Spirit to arrive. After Jesus ascends into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, guess who arrives on the scene in Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit. Was there a proper time for Jesus to arrive into this world? Yes. We celebrate it every Christmas, right? We talk about Bethlehem and angels and Mary and Joseph. There was a proper time for the Holy Spirit to arrive. And that was in Acts chapter 2 on the, the day of Pentecost. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, the estimated time of arrival, the ETA on a plane. You know, when your plane is supposed to land. Well, there was an ETA for Jesus, and there was an ETA for the Holy Spirit. The only problem with that illustration is now you can't come, you can't trust on a plane to land at their estimated time of arrival, right? It might be off by one or two hours or five or six days. So it's just not as accurate as it used to be, I guess. But Jesus arrived on earth at the proper time, and the Holy Spirit began his ministry at the proper time as well. And uh, just, just to back up just a little bit, the Holy Spirit wasn't working in the Old Testament, but he did not work in every person. A few people had the Holy Spirit, but not everybody. So that's a blessing that we have today. Now remember, Jesus said the bottom line with the Holy Spirit is that he has come alongside of you to help you. He's going to be with you forever. He's the advocate, the comforter, the counselor, the helper. He has come alongside of you to help you, and he's going to be there with you forever. So how does the Holy Spirit help us? Well, there's a big way that we need to talk about today. And we're going to read a verse, and when we read this verse, people tend to focus on the wrong part of the verse. People tend to focus on the wrong part of this verse. But here's how the Holy Spirit helps us. These are the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. The Apostle Paul says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Through wordless groans. If you want to understand the Holy Spirit a little bit better, a little bit more, read Romans 8. Read Romans 8. Really good, really great chapter in the Word of God. I wanted to preach on Romans 8, but no offense to Paul. How do you pick Paul over Jesus, right? So we're focusing on Jesus with just a little bit of Paul mixed into uh, mixed into this uh, this lesson but Paul says the Holy Spirit came to do what he said in the same way the Spirit does what anybody see it in the middle start to, it starts with H and ends with helps okay helps that's right thank you the, the Holy Spirit helps us in our what weakness the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness how is the Holy Spirit helping us he's helping us in our prayer life, we don't know what to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Intercede is just a fancy word for when I pray for you and when you pray for me. Interceding and intercession is just a fancy word for praying for someone other than yourself. Pray for your parents, pray for your kids, that's intercession. You pray for me, that's intercession. I pray for you, that's intercession. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now that last part is the part that everybody wants to focus on. What does wordless groans mean? What is this 
How do we explain this? How do we understand this? And I don't know if anybody has a really good, solid understanding of the wordless groans part. But to focus on that part we don't understand, and look at all the rest that we do understand, is, is a, a, would be an injustice. Because we need to remember what Jesus said and what Paul said measure up exactly. Because Jesus said the Holy Spirit has come to help you. And what does Paul say right here? The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. When you were doing those home renovations, did you have to move big, heavy stuff? Furniture and appliances and things like that? When, when you're facing an object that you're, you're not strong enough to move on your own, what do you do? You get help. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm here to help you in your time of weakness. When you have a, when you have a heavy burden, you're not carrying that burden alone. You know who's carrying that burden with you? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. <coughs> when we don't know what we ought to pray for. Have you ever felt that way? More than once? Maybe even this past week? Maybe this coming week? I don't know what to pray for. I don't know how to pray for this person. You know who knows if you don't? The Holy Spirit. He knows. We might not know, but he does. In fact, the word intercedes is a constant word. That means he's always, constantly, continually interceding for us. When we're talking about interceding in prayer for other people, how does it make you feel when someone says, I'm praying for you? It makes you feel good, right? It makes you feel good. Well, this verse tells us that the Holy Spirit is praying for you. He's got your back. He, the Spirit himself, intercedes for us. He doesn't ask the apostles to pray for you. He doesn't ask the prophets to pray for you. He doesn't seek out the angels to pray for you. You know who's praying for you? The Holy Spirit. He is interceding for you. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Again, go back and read Romans 8, and you'll find so many good truths about the Holy Spirit. In John 4, Jesus said the world cannot accept him because it, see, it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So why does the world not accept the Holy Spirit? Because the world accept other things that we can't see? Yeah. Of course, right? I mean, if you climbed up on the roof of this building and jump off, what's going to happen? Boom. You're going to fall. Why? Gravity. gravity. Can you see gravity? Nope, but you can feel it, right? Um, there's so many things that we can't see that we, uh, that we believe in. We don't have a problem accepting it. You know, we really can't see oxygen, but we believe in it message gets from your phone to my phone but I can read the text message right but that's the way you know just because you can't see doesn't mean you don't have to believe it at all but Jesus says that's the problem with the world the world wants to see things the world wants things to be physical and I want you to notice that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he and him he says the world cannot accept him it needs with you the Holy Spirit is not an it the Holy Spirit is not a force the Holy Spirit is not just a power. The Holy Spirit is a person. That's what Jesus says. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit lives with you and the Holy Spirit will be in you. Jesus said after, remember he said, it's good for you that I go away because after I go, I will say in Acts chapter 1, he goes away. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit arrives on the scene. And the Holy Spirit arrives in Acts chapter 2 first on the apostles. The apostles are speaking in foreign languages that everybody at Pentecost can understand. It would be like a gathering of all the nations of the world and we would be able to speak. You know, the United Nations does it through technology, but the Holy Spirit does it through a miracle. And that's what happened in Acts chapter 2. Because in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit arrives, when the Holy Spirit is there for the day of Pentecost, this is the very first time the message of Jesus will be preached. The message of Jesus was going viral. And you know who was pushing that message out there? The Holy Spirit. 
I think the Holy Spirit was doing. And Peter preached this wonderful message in Acts chapter 2. I mean, he said, guys, you guys love the great days of Israel, but if we go to the tomb of King David, David's dead. But if we go to the tomb of Jesus, guess what? His tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. And he said, this Jesus whom you crucified is Lord and Christ. And the people said, well, what do we need to do to get right with God? And here's what Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here were people who believed in God, but they hadn't heard about Jesus yet. But now they have. As in Jesus' name, God performs two wonderful things for you. Your sins are forgiven, your sins are washed away, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in just a matter of seconds, both of those, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The sins are removed, and the Holy Spirit moves in. That's what's going on in baptism. That's what's going on in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. That's what happens every time you witness the baptism. That's what happened when you were baptized. The forgiveness of your sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you need the book of Acts, because the Holy Spirit is working all throughout the book of Acts. In fact, about half of the times that the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, it's in the book of Acts. About half the times it's referred to in the New Testament, pardon me. About half you could read through the book of Acts if you need a long study. Read through Romans 8 if you need something a little bit shorter. But again, let's come back to Jesus. <clears throat> what Jesus said in John 14, verse 25. Jesus said, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Jesus said, The Holy Spirit will teach us. The Holy Spirit will teach us. We need to remember, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit was the one who helped the apostles write down the words of Jesus. We're reading from the Gospel of John. We're reading from John chapter 14. John didn't do this along the way, but it was the Holy Spirit who helped John write these things down. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will teach you and remind you of everything I have said to you. And that's what the Holy Spirit did with the books of the Old Testament, the Gospels, and the books of the New Testament. It was the Holy Spirit working in these men, working in these writers, Moses, David, Isaiah, working through them so that we can have the Word of God. If you want the Holy Spirit to teach you, this is the place to go. Go to the Bible. And I love this quote from Jack Cottrell. Jack Cottrell, a great Bible teacher, Bible professor, he passed away last year. The most important thing the Holy Spirit ever did for us was to give us the Bible. It was the Holy Spirit who spoke through these men and reminded them of the words of God. And as the Holy Spirit worked through them, they wrote it down, and here we are reading it 2,000 years later. And that's all the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helped them write the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit is with us to help us obey the Word of God. And we're actually at a great advantage because what it says, but we have all of the books of the Bible to choose from. All 66 books that we can turn to whenever we want. And that's where the Holy Spirit wants to teach us through these books that he's given to us in the Bible. The books of the Bible that we find in the Word of God. Uh, in the future, you know, kind of from here on out. I want you to look, not look for, but when you come across a passage, kind of open your eyes and be on the lookout for when you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all appearing in one place. Remember, we talked about how they were all there when Jesus was baptized, right? The Father spoke and the Spirit descended on Jesus, and Jesus was the one baptizing in the same verse that we read today. Well, let's do a little experiment, okay? Let's see if we see this here in a passage that I want to share with you. It's from Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3 verse 4 says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we In verse 4, we see God mentioned, right? We see God mentioned. 
And what does God do for us? God saves us. Why does God save us? Because we're good people. Because we're good looking. Because we're from the United States. No. Why does God save us? Because of his mercy. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But the kindness and love of God appeared to save us because of his mercy. Verse 5, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? It helps us in our weakness, right? When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Did you see Jesus? Did you see the Holy Spirit? They're all mentioned. And what are they doing? Their goal, their purpose is to save us and to renew us and to justify us. Justify just means that it's like we've never sinned at all. To be totally forgiven of the past sins. Love the love of God and the wonderful passage. And they're all described in this group of three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you one more. This one's a whole lot easier. And it's kind of a good blessing and it's a wonderful prayer to pray. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What a wonderful prayer. That should be our prayer for ourselves and for one another. May the grace of God, excuse me, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You might recognize some of the lyrics that say, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The song is called Holy, Holy, Holy. And that's our invitation song for today. So if today's the day for you to respond to the love of God, we encourage you to uh, step forward and make those decisions today as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy.
you so much for your love. We thank you that you created us. And uh, Lord, we also are thankful for Jesus Christ because Jesus was the one who became a human being. He became man and he came to this earth to uh, give his life on the cross. Not because of our righteousness, but because we were sinners. Christ died for us. And Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is He helps us in our weakness when we don't know what to pray. He's interceding for us. The Holy Spirit gave us the word. And God, we want to read the word so we can know more about you. So we can be more like you.